Hello, and welcome to the Tumble Tankard. I am Jim, a.k.a. Argent Wind, and I am your host here for dm and Chat, where we talk about all things Dungeon Mastering. I want to thank everyone here for being already in the chat there talking. Love seeing you guys there. It's awesome. Uh, I also want to remind you guys, if you're looking for D&D games, we are in the process of adding more campaigns to our Discord server. We have, I believe... Two or three more that just popped up in the last week or two, and some ones that are in the planning stages. So, looking for games, looking for players. If you want to run a game, come on over to the House of Gamers. Uh, link will be down below. And uh, love to have you join in with us and see if we can get some more campaigns going. Um, we're up to, uh, I think, what, eight or nine now going? No. About five or six right now, at least. Anyway, I, I lost count. So, um, so, it's good to see you all. Um, today, we are talking about magic. Not Magic the Gathering. No, no, no. Magic as it applies to our campaigns. And realizing that magic is the cornerstone of the fantasy genre. It's what sets the fantasy genre apart from sci-fi and historical fiction and anything else that involves swords and horses and, and knights and things like that. Magic is what brings the game from just a bunch of people running around hitting people with swords and sticks to a fantasy element, having magical creatures, having spells and wizards, and all of that being part of the world is what makes fantasy something we all have been, uh, <laughs> something that we all can enjoy and we're all here and to be a part of. So the thing about magic is there is a lot of different facets and a lot of different things that go throughout the world to make magic really a part of your world. And I do want to say this, this topic came up and I'm not sure if he's in the chat here, but Lyle say hi, if you're in there, because this was your question that you threw to me a little while ago. Um, magic is not just about spells and traps. It's not just about the mechanics. It's not just a game mechanic. Um, it's part of the world. It's a way to flavor your world with supernatural elements from the people that are actually throwing around spells to the creatures that are inherently bound to the magic that make up the, the whole world around you. So what, how do we make our magic our own? Well, I will say this in D and D the magic system is very, very codified. It is very set in what and how it works. If you're first through ninth level spells, you have spell catchers with spell slots. And I will say this, there's not a lot that you can do to change that mechanic without rewriting the entire game. And so if you want a custom magic system, if you want to do something completely different than D&D, you might want to look at a different system. Um, there are a lot of magic systems, games out there that use magic in different ways. Shadowrun is a, a futuristic cyberpunk society that uses magic. There's GURPS and Fantasy Hero. There's Fate systems, including the Dresden File games. You want an urban fantasy, modern day sort of game. Um, there are things like Cypher that has all kinds of crazy different ways of like incorporating magic with different types of characters. So really it comes down to if you feel that the D and D magic system doesn't work rather than trying to rewrite the whole thing and rebalance the whole game, understand that the magic system is really a core function of the game. And so by changing it too much, it can throw the whole game out of balance. So what can you do? Well, there are a lot of things you can do with magic. Just keep it within the structure of D&D. If you want to loosen up the restrictions on spell slots, you can convert spell slots to spell points. And for example, if you have three first level spells and two second level spells, that's three, th one, two, three, uh, seven points that you can spend. And you can spend those points in any way. A first level spell costs one point. A second level spell costs two points. And you can do things where you have this little more free form way of using magic in your world. If magic is more free form and less structured, then that's one way you can do it to open up that freedom um, of, of how to do things, uh, of how to make magic a little bit different in your world from other games. But the thing you realize is that those kind of changes are fairly really superficial. What makes magic work in your world is how it's viewed. What, what function it serves in the world. And you have games with high magic and you have games with low magic. And the standard D&D &D is kind of somewhere in the middle. And I will say this, just preface this right away, 
High magic is going to be easier than low magic, and I'll explain why in a little bit here. But um, how you do that, how you approach magic in your world there, and how it's viewed by the populace, how common it is, those are the elements that are going to make the magic level in your game change. So a high magic game. This is some of the game I'm running right now, Avarice, on Saturdays, 2 o'clock, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, come by and watch sometimes. Uh, I, got, I know a few of my players are there in chat right now, so say hi, folks. Um, magic in a high fantasy game, in a high magic game, is common. It's every day. People know it. They recognize it. They are not surprised when magic happens because you may have at magic in your homes. In Avarice, you have literally people with magical lighting, magical heating, magical cleaning devices, magical communication devices. It's very much like our modern day world here, but magic takes the place of our electronic devices. And however, whatever mechanics you use to make that happen, be it enchanted gemstones or manatech devices like in my world, or some sort of alchemical craziness or some sort of steampunk type element, there's all different ways to flavor that. But it becomes an issue that magic is everywhere throughout the world. It's part of everyday life. It's part, it's, it's common. People are not surprised to see it. So magic is also in demand. People actually seek it out and buy it. You may have, um, you may have uh, common folk running around that have familiars. They may have minor magics that they actually can cast. It's fairly common for people to have some magical ability, either something they learned or items that let them do things, or they've learned a smattering of magic from somebody nearby. Towns are going to have magic shops and apothecaries, an alchemist that sell potions. These kind of things are all going to be part of that world. And it's not going to be a surprise when you walk into town, you're going to like, okay, there's the general store, there's a clothing shop, there's an armor, hey, there's a magic shop. Oh, hey, there's a potion seller. Those are going to be in a high magic world. So that means that players are going to have access to more. There's going to be more common things within the game for them to, have, for them to use. And that can cause some game balance issues. We'll get into balancing here a little bit here. The other piece besides with the, with around the players and the towns is in a high magic world, there's going to be more magical creatures, more supernatural elements, more things that deal with the planes. Maybe, you're, maybe you have uh, uh, earth elementals that pull carts for you or air elementals that, that push things through the sky. There's all this kind of thing that goes along with a high magic world that those elements are around. And so you have more magical creatures. You have more spell-casting enemies. You have a lot more to do with the outer, with the planar structure here. And the idea that, that mana or the arcane or wherever it is, is all around you. And more people have access to it, including the bad guys, including the monsters out in the, out in the forest, including the things underground. There's magic everywhere. There's more mythical elements of magic, talking about the olden days when magic was more rare. There's the idea of somebody always trying to make bigger and better magic. This whole thing of these wizards' guilds trying to go crazy and do things that might break the entire world. There's all kinds of fun little plots that can come from a high magic world that involves magic gone wrong, magic being corrupted. So the idea that the magic is there for everyone to use for good or ill can be a common theme in a high magic game. There'll be more, as I mentioned before, more planar interference. In a high magic world, portals and gates to other planes, the Feywild, the Hells, whatever else at like that. You have bad guys summoning demons. You have bad guys throwing elementals at a town or a village and having to defend against that. Those are kind of things you're going to see where you have literally planar influence on the campaign, on the world, and on the events the party is dealing with. And I'm not, I'm kind of staying away from clerical magic, but understand there's a whole divine magic side and a natural magic side as well. And the ebb and flow of those types of magic also color your world. So in a high magic world, if they're all high, you're going to see a lot of like druid circles and powerful nature clerics and things like that alongside those crazy wizards and artificers, alongside those primal uh, or those, those um, 
those priests with their high level spells and divine magics and tapping into uh, dark deities that do terrible things. It's all going to be sort of a, you kind of balance the levels of the different types of magic. And this does get into kind of 1 D&D, bringing back those elements of those three types of magic. The arcane, the divine, and the primal. And having those three different sources of magic. And so what you tap into and how you do colors what you do. It also colors the threats you deal with. It also affects the uh, campaign events that are going on. And just the things you interact with in the world. So keeping in mind that not only do you have different levels of magic in general, but different levels of different types of magic. And that can cause some interesting little interplay between different, different types of magic users, in fact. In a high magic world, you're going to see a lot more magic items. And this is where I'm talking about balance. So the idea of characters getting magic items, especially powerful magic items that give combat benefits, it's going to make your campaigns a little, your encounters a little bit hard to balance. So the idea that you have a person with a plus one sword and everyone in the party has a magic weapon, well, suddenly those ghosts that have resistance against non-magical items are a lot less of a problem. Or those other creatures that require certain type, certain power level of magics or have certain resistances, and you've got all the resistances covered because of your magic items, it makes things more difficult because the party can handle more, they can dish out more, and they're not going to be de dealing with these weaknesses that they might have otherwise in a, different, in a different magic setting. So keeping that in mind, you may consider having more magic items for convenience. Again, everyone's using magic items for all kinds of normal mundane things, so those are going to be available to the party. Items that aren't quite as powerful, but still unique or interesting. Now, D&D has an issue with magic in the fact, in the, in the idea of the attunement slots. You have three things you can attune. And in a high magic game with a lot of magic items, you may consider looking into uh, ways of getting more attunement slots having more items that don't require attunement, having items that maybe as the person levels up, they no longer require attunement, but they can still use them. Having items that can sort of combine abilities in some way so that you have fewer things that require an attunement because you, because you combine two items together. And that's where a high magic like enchanter type could maybe combine this, these two items that both require attunement into one item through some sort of arcane process or some sort of divine process. You have a, have a god of the arcane that's helping you out there. So the idea that you, now you can consolidate items under one attunement slot, or having a fun thing like sets of items, that the three, three items together would cause attunement, but you have all three, now they only require one attunement slot. And they have abilities that activate because you have all three. So the fun thing there, you have different ways of making those attunement slots work for you or there's we've tossed the idea around in some of our some games i've played in here of just making the attunement slots you have based on your proficiency score in some way maybe you have uh attunement slots equal to your proficiency score or your proficiency score plus one or whatever you're going to think about doing there Keep that in mind that as you present more magic items not only do you affect balance but it puts a difficulty with a player that they're going to toss those cool items that don't have a combat benefit because they can't afford the attunement slot. So, so that's something to do with ma high magic games, figure out a way to balance attunement, to balance power levels so that, so the encounters don't become trivialized, but that the party has more fun things that there are in, in within their arsenal. Um, the idea that magic can be used for communication travel um the idea of having my party in my group here has saddles of summoning they can summon a horse for eight hours they don't have to board a horse they don't have to uh um carry uh carry a bunch of horse feed they don't have to stable a horse they just summon the horse right where they go and then dismiss the horse and put the saddle away um in a bag of holding or whatever else they've got there so there's a 
travel like that. Having more items that do long range travel, like carpets of flying or brooms of flying or things like that, that allows you to go to, uh, um, it allows you to get different places, uh, in, in, in a, in a shorter amount of time and being able to, to fly, to ignore like terrain and everything else. Something you don't want to do with a first level party, but by the time the party came up to eighth, ninth, tenth level, those kind of travel options should become more available. Having teleportation networks in a high magic setting, teleportation circles from one place to another, that, that once they ally with themselves with a location, they can now use that teleportation circle to jump from there to here. And they can get around the world and do more in a way that's going to help drive the story forward without having to go, okay, well, hop on your horse. It's going to be a week's time, week's time to get from here to here. Or you get to charter, charter an airship and fly from here to here. Again, it, those, those places where you're kind of, it, your, your camping is happening in one place, those ways of shortening travel means you can get into the story more um, without having to deal with the mundane aspects of getting from point A to point B. In a low magic game, that's going to be more of the journey that you have here. You're going to have those travel. You're going to have those random encounters. But in a high magic game, you, you sort of lose those after a while because it becomes more about the crazy threats and the magic you're dealing with than it is about the survival aspects of a low magic game. And again, things for convenience and everything else. Um, ways to make items that help you clean things or have food and water. If you want to like basically... Um, carry around rations and everything else. High level, we, we don't track those things usually. But in a high magic game where you can just create food or have a device that creates food and creates water, then you don't have to worry about those specific needs. Survival checks become less of a, less, less of a, less of a serious need for the party. So again, high magic, go crazy. Flavor it however you want. Um, there's a lot of different examples of high magic settings. Um, things like, um, uh, like Eberron's a very high magic setting. It has like actual, like, like mechanical trains and airships and crazy, uh, robots and everything else in it there. Um, Iron Kingdoms, if you know that game there, which is a, uh, based off the, uh, miniatures game called War Machine has, it's very steampunky, but very high magic. Um, it actually has some elements that, 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 um, that inspired some things that I use in, in my campaign for it with that, with Avarice here. Manatech sort of had a little bit of uh, um, influence from the Mechanica from that game, um, which I believe is right up here. <laughs> uh, so let's shift from high magic over to low magic. So low magic is going to have its own inherent issues. It's more about survival. You have less things for convenience. You're going to have less magic items available. And I would say right off the bat, in a very low magic setting, you're not going to have wizards and artificers. Wizards and artificers are all about codified magic with formula and devices and things like, and materials and, and spell books. In a low magic setting, you're not going to have that available. It's not going to be something, I mean, a wizard's going to be extremely rare. And the idea of that being someone who's just running around doing stuff uh, with a with a group of local locals fighting off little goblins or whatever else like that isn't going to be something that's going to be part of the game. So, I mean, it maybe not initially, or you might have to reflavor them in some way to make them work. So, the idea of uh, magic levels being less means that certain types of magic are not going to be available. Something else you're going to think about with low magic settings is where do you cap the magic? The idea of someone being able to resurrect or cast wish is beyond a low magic, magic setting. So you might want to think about doing something on the lines of like, there are no spells beyond third level or fourth level, maybe on, maybe on first or second level. And to do that, you could do a couple of things. You can say spell classes can't be, progress beyond a certain class. Like you only go to fifth level in a spell casting class. And then you have to multi-class into something that's not spellcasting or different types of magic. So you never get up to those super high-level spells. You don't have teleportation. You don't have conjuring demons and everything else like that because a low magic setting wouldn't have those things. So you can kind of play with that of how do I make my world work for a low magic setting? Just being aware that that means you're going to need to put some limits somewhere in order to make that happen. 
Um, magic is going to be rare. It's going to be feared by a lot of places. It can be mistrusted or just misunderstood by a lot of the common folk that are out there. Pr producing fire with your hand is going to be something that might get you burned at the stake. It may not work, but the idea that you can do something like this is frightening to people in a low magic setting. So you don't have to, so you, you might run into that problem of how do I be, uh, how do I have magical abilities, but keep it secret from the people that might be afraid of me for having it. And the idea that it can cause damage on a, on a catastrophic scale to a, to a village when you drop a fireball in the middle of it, my players, you have ways of, uh, so people, people they see that kind of magic and they think something's good, bad is going to happen. We need to run these people out of town. We need to imprison them, whatever, or start attacking them, whatever it's just to put them down there. It can get, yeah, as, 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 uh, P ribbon, there was saying it can get dark. So you can really, in a low magic setting, magic becomes something to be feared, something to be, something to deal with, um, something to be shunned or pushed away. Uh, maybe hated or hunted for being magical, using for using magic. There is going to be, in a low magic setting, fewer magical enemies. So the idea of... Uh, you, <laughs> the idea of having enemies that are resistant to non-magical items are probably not going to be very present in your, in your setting. Or realizing that if they are, they're going to be a lot bigger threat. Suddenly they're doing half damage because nobody has a magic weapon in the game. And any sort of effect that you can generate, like a, like a, a spell or a cantrip that you can use, that gives you a magical effect or a class ability that gives you a magical effect to your, to your weapons or attacks, is going to be a huge benefit in those situations. So now those things really shine as opposed to the guy, I got a plus one sword, I, I, I can take care of this ghost, as opposed to the paladin who can go, I can use divine favor and make my hammer hit this ghost harder than anyone else in the party. Those magical abilities really shine and come forth in a low magic setting. They become more important when you do have them. So kind of interesting way to, way to look at it there. Um, magic is often a way, a way to limit your magic is control the source. If magic is generated by something in the environment, uh, pockets of mana, crystals, uh, strange magical plants or whatever else that those can become a, a, a rare commodity. Like if you are required to have some sort of enchanted thing to use your magic or expensive material components, if the source of that is hard to get, it limits how much magic you can do. An easy way to prevent people from doing things like, oh, I could just revivify, raise dead, revivify, raise dead, anytime someone dies, maybe the church, if you have a setting like this, maybe the church controls the diamond trade. And suddenly the diamonds you can't find. This actually came from a friend of mine, an idea that he had in the campaign where the church literally controlled the diamond mines. So in order to bring someone back from the dead, you had to go to the church to get diamonds. And you had to basically do favors for the church to get the things you needed to do, needed to bring people back from the dead. So another way to kind of control magic and stuff. Controlling the source or making it limited in some way will limit the power level of magic in the game. Again, you're in fewer magic. You have a fewer magic items. Um, you're not going to have. You're walking around with trekking with a bunch of magic items. So the three to two, three attunement slot rule, they may never get to that three attunement slot in in a low magic game where there aren't a lot of magic items available. And something to consider then, if you're not going to have magic, you may consider non magical augmentations. And there's some cool sources out there that have this, where you have enhancements to um, enhancements to your uh, weapons. that are basically like, like, like making them balanced better, making them out of better materials so they hit harder, making them uh, a finer points so they can pierce things easier. All of those things can be happen. They're still not magical but they are still augmented in a way that gives a player a little bit of an edge as they, as they do level up. So you may not have a plus one sword, but this sword is plus one to hit because it's balanced perfectly and well-made. It kind of goes back to the older ideas and previous editions of masterwork items. Having a system like that in a low magic system is really helpful. Um, 
And then think about a low magic setting, the, the effect it has on the environment. Is, is low magic because magic is unstable and unpredictable? You have rifts that open up, or you have these high and low pockets of mana that cause magic to fail or fizzle or just go crazy. Now magic becomes less reliable for the player to use. So those environmental effects can really tweak how magic is done because it's a threat. It's a problem. It's difficult. At the very least, there's more wild magic type things like wild magic sorcerers, those, those mana magic surges that can happen to any spellcaster especially in certain areas of the world where magic has gone crazy. So, again, low magic, high magic, everything in between. How you flavor the world, how you make, that, how you make those balance changes, it's going to have a huge effect on your campaigns and makes, make one game completely different from another with one basic change. How high, how prevalent is magic in the world? How difficult or unreliable is the magic? And what do the people think about it? What is it? What does the common folk look at magic and say? Um, so, um, again, I will say low magic is it has its problems because you're dealing with balance issues and the idea that now I don't have a high level wizard, I don't have a high level sorcerer, uh, cleric, whatever to do these crazy things that magic can do. I have to rely more on the non-magical things that we have. And that can, that can make it some interesting differences in your party composition and how you approach things. Because more about the problem-solving aspect and less about what kind of magic can I throw at it. <laughs> so, again, some fun ways to tweak magic in your world that makes your campaigns feel totally different. Uh, and the, to go beyond that, how do you flavor magic? How do you make magic your own? Well, first of all, if you have magical players in your party, magical casters, whatever else that, encourage them to make their spells unique to them. If they're sorcerers, their magic is all inherent. It's all lure. It's all something that's part of them. So their magic is going to be fairly unique. Let them tweak the spell descriptions. Let them, let, them, let them change the spell names. Maybe even tweak the mechanics a little bit. Maybe your fireball doesn't do fire damage. It does thunder damage. You do a thunderball instead of a fireball. Maybe you have... Um, uh, psychic spells that do force damage instead because it's more telekinetic blast instead of a psychic damage there. You can do these things where you tweak the damage types based on what fits for the character. And even your wizards might develop a different formula that uses a different way of doing a similar spell and they make it their own. Elden's Lightning Rod in my game. Uh, it's essentially a second level spell that can potentially have the ability to stun somebody uh, but does... Con comparable damage to a scaled up shocking grasp at range. Um, so the idea that you can just kind of tweak spells there and just look at spells of similar levels, consider what elements you're involved here. Certain elements are harder to resist than others. Bringing in necrotic or, or, or radiant types of damage can really change a spell, can change the effect, can change the feel of the spell and what it does. So tweaking your own spells, reskinning your spells to what fits for you. And I see yeah, exactly um, the idea that you have a sorceress that's casting black tentacles and they're not that kind of thing. Well, no, they're maybe uh, similar to their, their version of arcane hand. Instead of arcane tentacles, it's just like basically flailing like hands, purplish energy hands that fly out there or just anything that makes more sense for the character, feel free to reskin it in a way that makes it feel like their own. And that again, tailors the magic to your world and to your party. So it makes it feel more unique. So the idea of tweaking abilities, bringing in encouraging people to split across different classes, having multi-class warlocks and sorcerers and bards and wizards. All of that just completely shifts magic around to different things. It also tones the power level of the spells down because your progression won't go up to the higher level spells, which is a lot more fun flavor to play with. And so maybe in, in a game there, you want to encourage people to multi-class more. And, just, and so that's something you can look, look in there. Um, uh, having more magical feats, having, and if you have to make up some feats that make sense for your game, if you want to flavor a class ability that makes it makes more like a feat, you can do that. 
You're the DM. It's your game. It's your campaign world. So go crazy and have fun with it. Some, a, a, one of my favorite quotes um, is that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Arthur C. Clarke. It's kind of the reverse of that too. Any significantly advanced magic may be indistinguishable, indistinguishable from technology. So your what you do with magic in your world is what makes a world your own. So f- have fun with it. Go crazy with it. And realize that you're not bound to one specific thing. Even among the D&D, with the constraints of the leveled spells and the spell progression of cl- character classes and the character abilities, even that can be tweaked and changed as much as what feels good to you and your party. So have at it and have fun with it. So I'm going to open up the questions here. I guess we've got a, got a, got a pretty uh, active group here, now, so I might be asking some questions from you guys. I have a couple to get us started off here. So I'm going to start off with the first thing. Um, and the first question I have there is, that what are the best ways to incorporate magic into a homebrew world? Should it be there for a reason? Or maybe because D&D says it so. <laughs> uh, like, this, like, well, we, uh, we have in our, in, our, in our Discord server, we have, have uh, two campaigns, one started up there and one's about to start up, that are based on the arcane uh, world, the Runeterra, um, League of Legends, that world there. So the idea that there are different elements in there, toxic elements, and maybe less, more toxic damage rather than, rather than necrotic damage. You can replace elements in a way to make your spells seem different. So the idea, hey there, Peter Evan, actually, uh, good to see you in here. Uh, so the idea that you can replace elements. I've never really been a, been a fan of thunder damage. To me, thunder damage is, is concussive force. So thunder damage should be force damage. I get why there's a difference in terms of that, but it just always felt weird to have thunder because it's just a concussive force blast of force. Why is there force damage set? What makes force damage different from thunder damage? Well, force is more telekinetic, so it's less of a physical punch and more of an arcane punch in some way. I never quite understood that. So if it doesn't work for you, change it, drop it, shift it to something that does make sense for your world and for how you view magic in your world with your players. Be aware, however, that when you do that, there are effects that's going to have. Now you need to look at an ability that maybe something isn't is resistant to necrotic damage, but are they resistant to toxic damage or radiation damage? Is radiation damage the same as radiant damage? All these things are going to be a th- have to be things that you have to work out in your world and keep in mind when you're looking at existing abilities and existing monsters. Those kind of things are going to have to be looked at and, and, and tweaked in a way that makes them fit in your world. Can be done, just something you have to be aware of. Um, so any questions over yet there? I have a couple more. <laughs> Let me scroll up just a minute here. I'm going to see if there's anything any missing here. Uh, oh, here's a good one. For low magic worlds, do you think there's a dynamic idea to have sorcerers as villains like Thulsa Doom and Conan? That is a great way to look at it. It doesn't have to be that way. You could also have the the good sorcerer that's helping out and the bad sorcerer there or maybe the it, maybe there's an order of clerics or druids that are helping out or maybe the druids are the bad guys and you're trying to do something else there so i do love the idea that that magic is the threat and uh that basically the bad guys don't have to follow the same constraints that the good guys do they may have more high, more powerful spells that they are using in some way that makes them even more of a threat that makes them something that has to be dealt with because they have this magic, they have this terrible thing that they're using in some way that they now become the threat. So in a low magic setting, you might need to do that. And so that question was, I believe, from uh, um, Sad Turnip. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Excellent. Um, so yeah, the the a, a great idea for low magic campaigns where magic is still the threat, but because on a slightly higher scale than what everyone else is used to, now it becomes something that has to be dealt with and becomes even and even more it makes that that threat stand out more like so they have a higher level spell so yeah you have to keep that in mind with like again your low magic setting it's not constrained for everybody the way you constrain it for the players and maybe the players may 
slowly work their way up to having a fourth level spell or something else that could be a lot of fun for them. <laughs> yes, psychic damage, literal interpretation of words hurt. Yeah, so basically you just, you basically, you say something, it's kind of like vicious mockery in a way. It does psychic damage and it literally hurts someone because you've basically heart, like damaged their brain from the impact of your words. Um, a fun way of looking at that and flavoring it, maybe, maybe Bard doing psychic damage is literally just like, I am just insulting you. I am just making you, I'm belittling you to the point where you are just going to curling, curl up, curl up on the, on the ground and be unconscious from complete overwhelming sadness. <laughs> Who knows? It's a way to go. Um, so it'd be kind of fun. So what is the mechanical system for magic that I like, but never had a chance to run? Great question, Zach. Um, I really, uh, and anyone who knows me, knows me in real life here, and many of you who know me from online, I am a huge fan of Brandon Sanderson. And I would love to run games that involve the magic systems in his world. But those magic systems are very, very specific. They don't have a wide variety of spells. They have a really cool set of effects but they don't have the crazy variety that you find everywhere else. And you like Mistborn, where you have burning metals within your system, you can do different effects, but most people can do one type of magic. So it might be you burn, I believe it's tin, and you increase your senses and become super, super uh, aware of everything around you um, to the point where it's almost painful how much you can do. Burning pewter makes you super strong and tougher. Whereas... Iron and steel lets you push and pull metal objects. And so there's these great interplay of abilities, but it isn't this crazy wide array of magical uh, of magic that you find in D&D. But again, it doesn't really work in D&D the way it is. So you kind of have to find a different uh, a different way. And that's why... Um, yeah, I mean, making Alamancy and Farukami, exactly, the, from, from Mistborn is so, so cool. It just doesn't work in a DD and d setting. However, there is a Mistborn role-playing game out there. I actually have it right up on the shelf over there. Um, so if you're interested in something like that, again, look it up. There are systems for these other types of magics there. So you might need to venture outside of D&D to try different magic systems. So... There are so many cool things out there and so many cool ideas. And if you can find a way to bring into d and I guarantee there are third-party supplements out there that somebody has converted things over from a different system to d and and a way to do it there. But it's going to re require an entire rework of d and So I would say check it out, see if it works, give it a try. And if you have some ideas of how you want to tweak it or make it different there, absolutely go for it. It'd be so fun. Um, ooh, good question there, Green Dragon. Any magic systems in magic, in, is magic systems in other systems other than D and D? It would be easy to be easy for new DMs to to five e to pilfer for good ideas. There are, I think, um, something to consider is I've played a lot of systems. I'll just say that right now here. One of the things that Hero System, and to a lesser degree GURPS, GURPS is a mess when it comes to magic, so don't even go there. It's a nightmare. But the idea that having magical powers be like a specific ability, almost like a feat, where you balance, you have like certain, like, uh, um, what do they call them there? Advantages that give you an ability or a power that literally is this set of abilities. And now that becomes a focal point to your character. And by having a broad variety of things, like I have flame powers. Well, what comes with flame powers? Well, I can project flame. I can heat things up. I can uh, burn things to the ground. I can do more damage to, 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 to structures and stuff like that. So different things that you could do based on having those powers. And as you learn, as you grow in power, the amount you can do with them and how much you can do with it grows with you. Now, does that work in D&D? &D? It can. Think about the idea of, I don't have to learn Burning Hands and Scorching Ray and Fireball and Fire Shield and all the spells going up on fire. Say, no, I know Fire Magic. And it includes 
this bell, this bell, this bell, this bell from the different levels list there. And it means that now I can do this type of magic and this type of fire and this type of fire. And you don't have to be, you don't have to totally be stuck with the idea that I have to take that first level spell and that second level spell and that third level spell and that fourth level spell. No, I know fire magic and it includes all of these things. And then even fun things like now I can take cone of cold and make it a fire cone instead of a cone of cold. Or I can take lightning bolt and say, I want to do a line of fire. And I realize that sculpt spell in sorcery kind of does that, but it's something that, um, it's something that you can do that makes magic work a little bit differently in your world. And you can kind of take that idea from another system that now that I'm a fire mage, I get these spells automatically. I may know more, but I get these automatically. And it's a way of tweaking things around there a little bit. So think about maybe, and that would eventually maybe include like Elder to Death for fire. Um, so it's a fun way to go with other systems. And, and, and as, as I see Bernie there, my flame, flame Oracle from Pathfinder, the idea is that you get all of the fire spell because you're this type of thing. You may have other magics and you may be limited in what other magics you can take. Maybe you have your flame wizard, you can't take any cult spells. So you can kind of tweak that back and forth however you wish there. So um, I'm not sure that I really found other systems that, systems that are, are easy for new DMs to bring in there, but there are other ones to consider. Um, and at least some, some mechanics you might be able to bring in, either as a feat or as a sub, as, a, as, a, as an archetype or subclass for, for D&D. Um, and just ways of doing that that bring in a new element or a new flavor to a class that doesn't exist already, but you like it from somewhere, bring it in. You can do that. Um, so the idea of, I, I answered this somewhat here, but another question I've got sitting over here that I want to bring, um, and I'll come back to yours there, uh, P-Ribbon. Um, uh, how should magic scale different in a high, level, high and low level campaign? Now, again, you're talking about, you automatically have a scaling effect in what spells you can do. But what you're going to run into in a high level game there, and this is something right now in my high, in my, my game is high magic. Every character in the party can cast spells. They're all magical. Now they can cast different levels of spell based on the class, based on the, uh, the subclass they are or the class in, in, and if they multi-classed or not, those kind of things mean that they can change that, that level based on that, but understand in those games, as you level up, that magic is going to get more powerful. So that's why in a low magic, in a low magic setting, you want to prevent those high level magics from coming into play. Whereas in the high magic game, you're not the only person on the block that has those. Yeah, I got disintegrate. So does the bad guy over there. I can raise dead. So can the bad guys. So that guy you killed, they get their body back, bring him right back and you're fighting him again next time. I'm a high-level wizard. I got the clone spell. I got Simulacrum. I can make copies of myself or have ways of giving myself back here. We've seen this in a specific, specific online campaign uh, to use to good effect. So the cool thing is that you have that high-level, low, high, the level of the campaign and is really going to affect the, the magic as well when you come to the high and low magic settings. So keeping that in mind, that, that that sliding scale of I'm in a high magic game, high level campaign, you are looking at some powerful magics being thrown around and not just by the party, by everything you're dealing with. Um, it, creative use of bonfire. Um, I actually have used it a couple different ways. I'm seeing some fun ones come across here. But the idea that and this is terrible, but if you do bonfire, create bonfire, if you throw somebody in a, in, a, in, a, in a portable hole and do bonfire in the portable hole and then close it, it burns the air out super fast. <laughs> There's no more oxygen in there real, real quick. So that, that person that's stuck in the portable hole with the bonfire that's in there is not only are they seeing the light getting dimmer and dimmer and then going out, when the light goes out, they can't breathe anymore. So, um, yeah, fun level. Fun. Uh, so one one idea uh, that comes out with the yeah, create bonfire 
and they've created creative use of a portable hole. Dark, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so uh, 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 another question over here, and I guess I, I come back to one. I think I see one other one up here. I want to grab in just a minute here, um, and I, I I see one from Green Dragon. That I'm definitely going to come back to. Um, how do you balance balance magic over a martial user? Uh, especially when fell counters are far more powerful, but in combat it's usually a pretty well balanced fight. This is where knowing that you have a high level wizard against a high level fighter, and we've seen this debate. If you've been online at all, you've seen the debate there. High level wizard wins. High level fighter wins. High level wizard wins. High level fighter wins. The fact is. The wizard has so many tools in their arsenal that a single fighter by themselves, without preparation, without some sort of magical edge on their of their own in some way, is going to be hard pressed to deal with a wizard at, of, a, of an equally high level because it's what the wizard can bring to bear. But understanding that very rarely are you one on one, and so a martial user, a martial a martial player. Um, a fighter, a barbarian, a high-level rogue, even multi-class versions of like 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 of, of like bar, like blood hunter. If you're into that set, set there, high-level monks. They have tools to mess with those magic levels, and so the idea that they have ways of increasing your movement to get on that spellcaster right away. Having the mage slayer feat can really mess up their day. Having ways of resisting magic a little bit more, uh, either through high enhanced uh, spell spell saves, um, all of those things are going to make that 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 martial user that that high level thing there. Plus the fact that if I'm a long range, I'm I'm a long range like sniper type person with rogue levels and ranger levels and fighter levels, and I just go boom, I crit the wizard for eighty damage, and they go and they drop like a stone. Understand. In that one-on-one -on -one setting there, fighters have their place, so do magic users. And no party is going to be completely, is going to be, no party is going to be complete without differing, different types of tactics, different types of composition. So don't be afraid to say, hey, I may be just a fighter, but I'm the guy who can take some damage. I'm the guy who's going to get in your face and make sure you can't cast anything. And I'm going to make sure that when you do get hit, you go down. That's the idea of the fight, the high level fighter role, that high level barbarian role. I am just going to pound my way through you and take you down before you can do those crazy magics there. And if and if you and if you do get it off, well, I'm probably going to survive because I got a lot more hit points than you. So keeping that in mind of of the casters versus non casters debate is going to go back and forth. But there's so many different tactics, so many different ways you can deal with it there that I wouldn't worry about it too much unless. Unless it becomes an issue for you, you fight that high level, high level lich necromancer with uh, with his whole minion, whole army of uh, of um, uh, lower level spellcasters that all have counterspell. Bye bye, wizards. <laughs> they all counterspell you, and now the fighter's the one who's going to shine because you can't counterspell a sword to the face. So, uh, great question here from Charlie. I want to jump into here. So, any thoughts on using the Gestalt system to emphasize a high magic setting? Oh my God! I will say, if you don't know what Gestalt is, Gestalt is an old, an old edition of D&D. &E, the idea that you play two classes at once, so you might play a fighter wizard, and you are literally a progressing in both classes at the same time. Or in my case, I played in a Gestalt game a bard sorcerer. Talk about spells for days! Oh my God, you never ran out of spells ever because I had you get you the, that progression of crazy numbers of spells, and I just know them all. So. The Gestalt system really brings around the idea of a high magic setting because now you can be a martial and a spell casting class at the same time. And I will say this, you got to be careful of Gestalt in D&D 5e because subclasses throw a whole new thing into the mix. And now you're dealing with all kinds of insanity with um, like I get spell casting because I'm an arcane trickster, but I'm also a druid and so i'm doing all these crazy things and then shape shifting into, into, into a monster and and you end up with almost paralysis in terms of uh how many abilities i have so it's a really cool way to go with high magic settings here but realizing that those characters become complicated to play there's so many different abilities to deal with there and 
again, it's hard to balance an encounter on someone that can do throw that many things at a party. How do you counteract that? Well, you have a party of a bunch of people that all have multiple abilities and spellcasting and martial abilities. They take all the weaknesses of one and eliminate it by taking the other class as well. So it's a little tricky to balance that, but it can be a lot of fun. I also would not recommend it for anything more than like three players. If you have like five or six players that all have two classes each, you are never going to challenge them with anything because they're just going to be throwing out all this insanity at your, at, at your villains. So I really recommend you kind of keep the number of players in a Gestalt setting to a fairly low number because, again, they're going to cover all the bases you need with those, those couple of people. Um, but it is a fun way to do a high magic campaign. Uh, when, when you have everyone that's got magical and martial abilities, again, peanut butter and chocolate. <laughs> you, you got the best of both worlds there working together and you're all different flavors of the same thing. Um... Help me realize that some spells are one class spell slots and not the and not, not use the proper slots. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, I do know that yeah, they do spell slots and uh, and spell levels are yeah. Again, knowing your different magic user classes and what they have, and knowing what they get at different levels and what's a spell slot. Oh, I can like a sorcerer or wizard. Their progression of magic is slightly different. So it's hard to figure out what spells you have without some sort of a, a slide rule practically to, to, to kind of work out a little chart of like how many spell slots you actually get based on that. Especially, oh my God, an assault game. I mean, how do you, you take whatever's better, I guess? Um, and I, it's been a long time since I played Gestalt, but I remember that spellcasters, double spellcasters especially, were just kind of crazy to figure out how to balance. Um, so there is that. Um, let's see here. I think I saw another spell up here. Another thing here. Another one. Sorry, I want to scroll back a little bit to see if there's any questions I missed here. Uh, if you cast a question before and I didn't answer it, drop it in the chat. Um, so I, so I, so I don't uh, miss it there. Uh, it moves a little, a little fast, so I, I may have missed a question or two earlier on. So, um, yeah, please uh, drop it in chat again so I can find it. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Ah, right. So, yeah, Warlock Sorcerer, seven level. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's, yeah, the, the, the Sorlock is broken. <laughs> There, there are ways to break that right there. And it's one of the things I hope that in one D&D moving forward, they find a way to balance it out and make that work a little bit better because, oh my God, uh, what you can do with that is just kind of, just kind of insane. Uh, I will say, as if any other questions come up here, drop them in here in a minute here. But I, will, I, want, I do want to say that if you're ever looking for ideas for um, high magic builds or crazy magic builds, or even just like, Use your online resources. Go online and just search for high magic D&D setting. And you might find a number of different ideas, at least for different, different, different ideas to use and use as a springboard for your own campaigns. If it's something you want to use wholeheartedly and jump into and say, play in this world, it's, it, can, it can bring a whole new flavor that you didn't expect. And if you don't use it entirely, you can at least use it as a basis for an idea that you want to work with. Um, like I said, I, um, uh, my, the, so the idea of Manatech in my world, um, uh, Manatech is, um, I'll just take a minute, minute for this here. Manatech is, is a high level magic thing in my world here where the idea that a Manatech it, it, at its core, Manatech is a reusable spell scroll. It's called a spell plate. And it's, it's a metal plate there with an etched spell on it there. You attach a battery, have an activation device, and it, literally goes off and the spell, anyone can activate the spell. Um, the idea that basically it becomes more like a wand almost and that reusable magic items and low level convenient things like having something that it heats up your food or clean something for you. And there's a lot of limitations that I put on mana tech to make sure that it isn't too crazy. But when you can just have a spell in your pocket that can be used in some way, and you have a certain number of charges, and those charges recharge like any battery would. 
recharge with the ambient magic mag, magic in the atmosphere around you or the mana the level of mana that you're in the battery is recharged and the next day you can use it again a certain number of times that idea of mana tech again came from the me mechanica from the iron kingdom setting the war machine uh the, the rpg version of war machine and a good friend of mine um who has something called arcano tech which was very similar where they basically took the idea of having um magical effects that are powered by uh batteries it was almost like circuitry that you kind of worked in there but i kind of took it and went rather than having like magical effects that were caused by these things i said no it's a spell literally you cast the mage armor spell you cast a firebolt spell you cast and you have ones like, like now i now have a gun that fires firebolts i replaced the I, I replaced the battery put in a new one here i have it, six more shots firing firebolt and it comes down to again what limitations you want to put on that in my world right now is that cantrips and spells they cannot be upcast with mana cap with mana tech or only at the base level um but again maybe somebody's developing that and in the future or maybe some crazy inventor maybe someone in the party even finds a way to do that they also can't do variable special effects so in other words like like, like a um like a chromatic orb, a uh, chromatic orb weapon. It fires out one type of chromatic orb that you choose when you create the spell plate. So it's a fire orb or a lightning orb or an ice orb. And it depends on what you have and you can't change it from cast to cast. It is what it is in the spell plate. But again, maybe someone down the road figures out a way to do differing elements um, or maybe even different elements and a way to upcast it. So those become unique uses of... The, the, the thing that you put into the world. Maybe you have things driven by potions. Maybe you have things by, by different magical gemstones or runic magic. There's all different ways you can flavor your magic that adds an element that the players can customize and grow with and play with. And even in some of those cases, they can be in low magic games. Maybe your, maybe your minor magics that you can do are based on that. In, in, in a way, it's similar to what the um, Artificer has in the way of the arcane tinkering or what the uh, gnome, uh, the gnomes, the rock gnomes can do with their little magical gadgets they can create. Um, so things like that, where you can think about like ways of generating magic that isn't overly powerful, but is very customizable and unique. So a rifle of demon slaying. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, uh, so one that last thing is don't be afraid to make new spells. Um, I've made a number of new spells. I've had my, my Artificer player making new spells. Just take a spell, something that might be missing from the game or something from a previous edition. I created the Wrist Pocket spell because it's basically like the Glove of Storing from D&D 3.5. And the idea of, I believe there was a Wrist Pocket spell in Pathfinder had it. The idea that you basically take an item in your hand and go, boop, and it disappears. And you go, boop, and it comes back. So it's something that, Again, I have a weapon. I don't want to carry this weapon around with me everywhere. I just go, flip, and it's gone. And then I can run around with it. Oh, bad guys are coming. Flip, comes back there, and now I have it to use. Um, or you want to hide something. Or maybe smuggle something out of a certain vault. Just saying, um, there are ways of doing things that you can do that make the magic unique to your world because you created it. You put it out there, and you can balance it, tweak it however you want, and you have a way to fit it into your view of what magic should be in your world. So I hope that helps out with magic. I hope you guys uh, got something today, got some interesting stuff here. Um, and if you, again, if you have any questions for future episodes, please throw them in the comment section here. Uh, message me on discord on the various servers that, that we share i know most of you come from uh multiple servers in discord here if you're on the house of gamers you can always find me there you can always throw questions at me uh within the chats chats there um if you're if you're able to tune in on saturday at two o'clock uh pacific time for our avarice ongoing game there we're coming up on almost a year that i've been running that game so it's interesting to see where the party's going and and just how uh big things we get they're all ninth level now and they're getting up into some pretty epic stuff. So um, love to see you guys there if you can. Um, again, if you, if you are DMs or want to try out DMing, come on over to 
uh, the House of Gamers there. Jump into our D and D campaign section there. Um, check in with us. We'll get you set up with a campaign, uh, your own chat, and everything else, and uh, a way to get your own game off off the ground and running. So appreciate having you here. Uh, appreciate you asking questions and being so active in chat there. You guys have been awesome. And uh, hey, we'll see you again next time here on DMD, DMD Chat. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Bye.